distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, to our follow-on webinar from the December session. And this was entitled, this one's entitled First Wave of Green Recovery, CE Building Renovation Strategy and RRP Expectations. Now, as we all know, this is part of the RRP plans, which are moving forward and the public sector across the V4 and across Central Eastern Europe have to present their plans or submit their plans by the 30th of April. And if we look at Slovakia alone, there was an estimate that for renovations of buildings, there was 700 million euros allocated. So the aim of some of these discussions is obviously to spend the money wisely, to use it as part of the green transition in CEE and to the benefits of the population. And this will only happen if it's done well. From the output from the event, there will be an output summary which we will circulate. But firstly, I would like to welcome, I would like to welcome uh, State Secretary Mikhail Kichka from the Ministry of Environment. State Secretary, welcome. Thank you, thank you. And the State Secretary in a few minutes will do the kickoff speech and will present the, his view. I would also like to welcome a number of you here today. Uh, Ladislava Sengolova, who is the Director General Ministry of Transport and Construction on Slo from Slovakia, welcome. Julian Popov, who is CEO of Building Performance Institution, former Minister of Environment from Bulgaria. Julian, welcome to another event. Thank you. Alexander Schnigotsky, Head of Energy, Climate and Environment Programme, Wiser Europe, who is actually uh, representing the Polish government or the Polish authorities and has authority to do so. So he made that clear to us in the correspondence. Uh, Martina Seiber, Ziba, rather, advisor to the Minister of Regional Development in Czech Republic. Hello. Martina, welcome. And then on the public sector, we have Pavel Kubitschka from CHES, ESCO, who's a long-term Globsec partner and member. Jan Matti from Signify and Ramon Zakera, who's the Director of Energy Efficiency and Climate Change at ERBD. Now, if we look at the attendees and the participants, it's, it's excellent. We have representatives from uh, the Office of the President, Norbert Carrillo, will be joining us, and Norbert's a great supporter and great driving force on uh, the green change. We, will ha we have the uh, representatives from the Dutch Embassy, the European Commission, EIB. We have our members, CBRE, HB Revis, VUB, Signify, and possibly future partners, Viola Energy, and of course, Slovenska Elektrana, who are active on our energy transition. A few of you I may have missed out, but I would like to now hand over to the State Secretary for his opening keynote speech. State Secretary, welcome and thank you for supporting us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, dear organizers, dear colleagues, dear viewers, first of all, please let me thank you for the invitation to this forum. I'm glad that we can continue the dialogue we started in December and look into the progress we have made. Ministry of Environment will be responsible for the part of the component which includes renovation of family houses where the largest portion of financing is allocated. The other important part dedicated to renovation of historical and public, public building will be implemented by our colleagues at Ministry of Transportation and Construction. Renovation of buildings component is part of a green economy segment of Slovak recovery and resilience plan, along with other, others targeting upscaling renewables, transport and decarbonization of Slovak industrial plants. Thus, it lies in the heart of the Slovak plan with considerable financial allocation. As for family houses, total allocation amounts to 50, 500 million euros. Improving the energy efficiency of at least 30,000 family houses, the imp implementation of the renovation concerns, their energy efficiency and adaptation to climate change, which is one of the biggest environmental challenges of today's society. 
the adverse effects of climate change will directly or indirectly affect all spheres of life and economic sectors. As the effects of climate change are already evident in Slovakia, it is important to adapt the planned projects in the building sector to the changing situation and take the necessary measures into to increase their resilience to possible negative effects such as rainwater harvesting, implementation of vegetation for roofs, preparation for average uh, outdoor temperature by passive interventions such as the installation of shading technology. Reducing the energy consumption of family houses will contribute to reduction, reducing CO2 emissions and air pollution. Support for the renovation of family houses will be implemented through a new scheme which will be built on existing programs and extends to green measures where possible and appropriate. It is further foreseen that the scheme will to a certain extent replace other existing ones targeting older houses renovation and will act as one stop shop for applicants. The component will enable the use of modern technologies in the renovation, the application of renewable energy sources, thus contributing to the European, European Commission's ambitions target of reducing emissions by 2030 in line with the renovation wave targets and the Paris Climate Change Agreement. With our efforts, we are following a few objectives. The implementation of measures to support the renovation of family houses will achieve energy savings at, of at least 30%. It will be achieved mainly through the implementation of roof restoration measures, facade insulation, upgrading windows and doors, and replacement of boilers. The implementation plan will elaborate the possibilities of motivating projects, project applicants or beneficiaries to higher level of savings, greener measures, and a complex approach to the renovation projects. Increasing the number of renovated family houses concerning improving their energy efficiency, taking into account the principle of energy poverty. The goal is to support a total of at least 30,000 households in 2022-2026. The year 2021 will be used to prepare the scheme and its technological and administrative support IT system and preparation of the implementation plan, which will govern the process. When it comes to the target group, we focus on owners of older family houses who carry out the renovation of a house by improving the thermal insulation properties of the building and replacing inefficient sources of heat and hot water with higher high efficiency equipment or installation of a new technology using renewable energy sources or waste heat in ventilation together with the integration of the prepared tool, the so-called boiler subsidies. The objective of the renovation of family houses are in line with long-term strategies with embrace the topic, the topic of energy efficiency in construction, such as the low carbon development strategy of the Slovak Republic until 2030 to 2050, or the integrated national energy and climate plan in the area of energy efficiency. Where the true challenge lies is its implementation. When it comes to the family house renovation, part of the component, Slovak Environment Agency will be in charge of the process. We have already started the analysis of current support schemes and with the identification of their strengths and weaknesses. Setting the structure of the implementation plan is the next important step on which we are working. Slovakia is planning to introduce a mechanism that would provide applicants, homeowners, with the possibility to support the complex renovation of their family homes in one place. In addition to traditional measures such as insulation of roofs, perimeter cladding or replacement of windows, this mechanism will allow the applicants to obtain support for renewable energy sources, energy storage equipment, 
electric or thermal, low emission combustion equipment for heating, and also for selected intelligent, intelligent digital service data devices that provide optimal management of energy consumption in a family house. Another essential point is a modification of legislation in order to align with the existing instrument of the contribution for the insulation of a family house. More emphasis should be placed on support for the renewal or replacement of technical equipment while focusing on poorer household. Where technically possible, it is appropriate to apply measures to increase resistance to possible negative climatic, climatic influences such as rainwater capture or a realization of vegetation roofs. Revision of the current support schemes for renewable energy sources and boiler subsidies make them more efficient and helps to avoid duplication with a contribution to the insulation of a family house. We see a large scale media campaign as an internal and integral part of the wall implementation process. When it comes to the real steps, it is going to be quite a challenge if you take into consideration the number of the houses together with individual nuances of every single project. We understand that it is essential to communicate with people who try to improve their home to the needs of the 21st century and to do their part in mitigation of climate change correctly. Creation of a new separate director, directorate in the headquarters of Slovak Environmental Agency, together with 10 regional offices reasonably close to the homeowners, wherever they live, should accomplish the task of smooth communication and project consultation. The assistance for applicants will help with questions like which measures are suitable for a specific family house or submitting an application into the IT system for, application, for applicants with limited possibilities of electronic communication. The Ministry of Environment also started the communication about the possibilities of cooperation with European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. I hope that the wall effort will bring the citizens of Slovakia closer to healthy and environmentally friendly future. Thank you very much for your attention. State Secretary, thank you very much for your comments. I think for everybody, it's delighted to hear that there is obviously a clear plan that clearly the Ministry of Environment is recognizing that climate change is affecting us directly in Slovakia. A focus on building or family home reconstruction, looking at technology and renewables, you're obviously looking for the quick wins, which is what we need. And obviously with a clear indication that, you know, 30% savings of energy in family homes will be significant. Delighted to see there's going to be a media plan linked to it, which is very, very important to reach out to the people. So State Secretary, thank you very much for those very clear comments. And we will move on to the, the other speakers. Thank you, sir. So, I would now like to introduce uh, Ladislava Sengolova, who's the Director General Minister of Transport and Construction in Slovakia, and her, she will be mainly speaking about historic buildings, I, I believe. So please, welcome. We're keeping these, uh, these interventions down to about four to five minutes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I would like to share with you short presentation. Uh, Uh, let me at the beginning to introduce you into current situation in the field of uh, building renovation. Uh, as you can see, uh, actual share of renovation uh, uh, in the Slovak Republic uh, in dwellings in residential buildings uh, is almost 70%. It's a very uh, good uh, number, but uh, when we compare it uh, with uh, uh, numbers uh, in dwellings in family houses and in non-residential buildings, uh, numbers uh, are not so great. Uh, 
uh, total uh, uh, estimated investment need in the building sector uh, is uh, more than 13 billion uh, billions of euro. Uh, that's why uh, we are in RRF focused on the, this type of buildings, dwellings in family houses and non-residential buildings. And our target is to speed up the renovation wave. A long-term building renovation strategy and how to reach uh, our goal in two, uh, 2050. Estimated rate of renovation is presented in the following chart. Uh, you can see uh, our prognosis uh, to 2025 and with different colors, blue, red, green, and purple, you can see uh, the, the shares uh, of uh, uh, light, medium, uh, or deep depth renovation. Uh, to reach the ambitious milestones towards the goal of decarbonized building stock uh, in 2050, the Slovak Republic needs to intensify the depth of the building renovation and to increase the renovation rate. Targeted groups uh, of the renovation measures and schemes are namely public, non-residential buildings and uh, family houses. The renovation depth is linked to the primary energy savings and has implications on energy, uh, energy consumption and thus reaching uh, energy efficiency targets. Uh, historical uh, buildings uh, and 30% uh, of uh, primary energy savings. We think it's a great uh, idea to be focused on buildings with uh, wor the worst energy efficiency uh, from the entire building stock. There are restrictions on the renovation of historical buildings uh, that do now allow the implementation of all possible measures uh, as in a standard construction. Modernization and renovation of historical buildings requires detailed planning uh, to respect specific conditions with an individual approach. Widely spread misconception is that historical buildings cannot be adapted to integrate new energy efficiency technologies to carry out renovation works on the envelope of the building or to apply the building management systems and automation in any way. The renovation of existing historical buildings has the potential to lead to significant energy savings, which can reduce overall energy consumption and CO2 uh, emission reduction in the European Union. The sustainable balance can be formed among the use of the building its energy performance and uh, saving its uh, historical value. It is realistic to achieve at least 30% of energy savings as a result of a historical building uh, renovation. Uh, to save on average at least 30% primary energy is the main, main precondition for using EU sources with 100 green tagging on the field of uh, building renovations. Uh, as was mentioned, um, uh, one of the components uh, is renovation of single family houses. Um, uh, and the second is renovation of listed and historic public buildings. Uh, this second component is in the competence of Ministry of Transport. So uh, I will uh, speak about this component uh, more. Total allocation is 200 million euros and uh, target is uh, to achieve minimum uh, 117,000 square meters of total renovated floor area. Um, in this component, we have, we have reform, elaboration of three methodologies and passportization of state-owned uh, 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 listed buildings. Uh, with a partial cost uh, uh, 6.5 million euros uh, and activity will finish till the fourth quarter uh, 2023. Investment includes renovation of historic and listed uh, public buildings and information campaign and educational seminars for professional public. 
partial cost is the 193.5 million euros uh, and activity will finish uh, till the middle of 2026. Uh, target group uh, are public owners, state, municipalities, and institutions under public law. Eligibility for reimbursement is expected from February 2020 to uh, the fourth quarter of 2026. Uh, reform uh, support investment, but reform is not precondition. Investment doesn't follow reform. Other components in uh, RRS, which are focused on uh, building renovation, along uh, with the volume uh, 700 million euros, uh, are, uh, are buildings in other components uh, with a budget uh, more than 300 million euros. There are building like schools, uh, hospitals, and so on, and uh, uh, they are divided in, in uh, different, uh, different uh, components. Um, that's why we can say that the total budget for building renovation in RRF is more than 1 billion euros. Effective measures. Uh, designing and realization of the measures uh, will be selected for this type of building uh, specifically and individual according to the type of building and considering uh, their historical value. Transformation of existing buildings into buildings with low or nearly zero energy demand requires high quality complete measures specifically uh, thermal protection of the envelope uh, uh, of the building, then uh, moisture elimination measures, use, uh, use of uh, renewable energy sources, and other elements such uh, as building automation and control systems, delivering additional energy savings reflecting the user conception pattern. Mandatory green measures in the component of historical buildings, if relevant, uh, will be removal and disposal of asbestos waste, detailed sorting and recycling of uh, construction waste, and uh, provision of nesting opportunities for protected species of animals. The financial allocation that should be used for measures without direct impact on energy consumption is limited to 10%. It's very important. Uh, that's why it was necessary to reduce the scope of uh, mandatory uh, activities. Uh, Ms. Singlova, thank you very much. Could you possibly wrap up because we need to move on to the next speaker. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. Very clear on, on the priorities and some excellent information. It's very good to see the public sector having clear plans which we communicate. I would now like to move over to Julian Popov, who's actually coming from Brussels and from Bulgaria. So as usual, multitasking Julian and very much looking forward to a dynamic brief by you from yourself. Thank you, John. Um, for, first, to clarify, I'm not CEO, I'm chairman of the board of, of okay. uh, BPA. And BPA is, um, I, I would like to think, uh, the, the leading uh, Brussels think tank on building policies. Um, thank you very much for putting this uh, subject um, exceptionally um, important as I in, was inspired this morning to call it in Twitter, the neglected golden mine of the transition. Um, indeed, the building sector is something that uh, could deliver massive savings, but not just uh, energy savings, so many other um, additional co-benefits in innovation, in energy security, air quality, and so on and so on. And in the period of uh, economic recovery after COVID, uh, the building sector is probably the, the best suited to deliver flexible, um, rapid uh, employment, uh, which could be 
was originally targeted. Um, we have in Central and Eastern Europe, if we have to um, define the quality of the building stocks, uh, I would say it, it's one word, it's bad. That's it, that's what we inherited. This inheritance, we haven't uh, get over it. And we have a lot to catch up. And um, it is different, obviously, in different countries. Probably the worst building stock is in Bulgaria and Romania. Um, Czech Republic, Slovakia probably is, is, is better. But overall, there is a huge, huge amount of work that needs to be done. Interestingly enough, for, for me, COVID uh, offers a very interesting opportunity in that. I, I mentioned that the employment opportunity and the flexible employment opportunity, but there is uh, one major barrier that stops us being ambitious. I mean, every time when we speak about buildings and building programs, we speak about small things, 20,000 houses, 30,000 houses, 1 billion here, 500 million there, this is nothing compared to the actual task of transforming the home of, of Central and East European to something that we can call um, European standard of, of your own home and the building. So, so what, what did COVID do? COVID did two things. First, it changed uh, uh, the, the working pattern. So we started looking at our homes in a different way. They're, not just our um, sleeping cells, there are uh, also our working offices, a place where we spend much more time. Uh, so that puts an extra focus on, on, on buildings and, and specifically residential. The other thing that is, um, um, uh, is very interesting in COVID is the changing of the financial saving patterns. Um, just last year, in I was looking at some figures in March, April, uh, France was saving about 10 billion, French people were saving 10 billion euros a year on average uh, every month. Uh, recently, I saw that UK um, savings increased by 125 billion euros. This is huge amount of, of money, which probably adds up to more than a trillion euro savings across the European Union, which are slipping almost dead money. They stay in the banks and you keep them in the bank and they lose money. And you lose money through inflation and through bank fees with zero interest rate. So uh, what can we do? For me, the huge question is, can we mobilize at least part, but a significant part of the savings and redirect them in a building renovation? There is this uh, kind of uh, urge that we can see if you talk to an electrician or if you talk to, I don't know, carpet fitter, they will say, oh, we have a lot of work now because people are focusing much more on their homes. And, and if you have spare cash, you spend them in, in, your, in your home. So the question is, can we devise policies that can get these massive savings, hundreds of billions, trillions, and redirect them to building renovations so that we can start catching up? Um, Bulgaria, poorest country, not very big country, it has more than 30 billion euros of savings that do nothing for the economy, literally nothing. They sleep in banks and they finance investment activities outside the country. So if the plan for, for um, recovery and uh, the, the recovery plans are designed in a way that can um, match and mix uh, different uh, financial sources and include personal saving, include ESCO component, include uh, personal contributions that are not saving, include personal uh, localized, uh, local authorities, national and other loans, um, then we can um, really generate the massive amount, financial amount that we need to A, push the economy forward. I believe that depending on the country, 
such an approach can deliver increase of one to two um, percentage point on, on GDP on top of the development, which is massive. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, politically we have to focus very much on this blending of instrument and uh, financial instruments and generating um, uh, additional uh, funding and uh, waking up the, the savings that are slipping in the bank. And, uh, and on one final thing, um, I heard very interesting uh, uh, stories and, uh, about the support for innovation and so on. Um, I personally think that we need some kind of a massive institution that can help both with the financial instruments, but also um, uh, uh, the, the whole technology and innovation in, in, um, in, in renovation. And that could be institutions that is national or, or in every single country, but it could be also regional. And I think probably Globsec can come up with, uh, with something uh, like that, a very, very ambitious, well-funded uh, institution for sort of building renovation moonshot in Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you. Julian, thank you very much. So from Julian, a call for action, wake up the sleeping giant of the savings. Let's do something. A common misconception, I think, about CEE. I was told, and okay, I, I'm English, but I'm sort of CEE converted. I was told that CE don't care about the green transition. Actually, we do. It's just we've inherited perhaps some of the worst building stock that there is. And this call for action is very important. But also the idea of linking with COVID and the recovery and rapid employment, which our young people need. These are excellent points, Julian, which we will bring up in the, the output. So thank you for that. And now I'd like to move over to Alexander Snigotsky, and who's from Poland, and you have your five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, I have some slides. I hope it's very visible. Yes. Yes. I see them. Great. Perfect. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank uh, thank you very much for invitation and for organizing this regional forum. So uh, we really believe that. Uh, uh, within the region, a discussion would be uh, very productive for all countries involved. So, one a short introduction to the institutions. We are independent think tank, so we also perform some support uh, service contracts uh, for public institutions, uh, and we had the pleasure to support Polish government in preparation of long-term innovation strategy. Uh, but also, we are. As an independent think tank, we also provide feedback to uh, over ongoing process, including uh, the, uh, the recovery plans. Uh, so today I will cover both the renovation strategy, key points, and uh, current draft of the recovery plan of Poland. <clears throat> so currently the long-term innovation strategy has been published, draft has been published in February 2021 for public consultation. And after giving a long list of feedback from stakeholders, this is currently being uh, addressed and uh, uh, it's expected that it will wrap up in uh, 2021. Uh, so it took some time, but uh, we are focused on quality. Uh, so new elements compared to previous aspects of the strategy, uh, previous versions of strategies uh, for previous years is assessment of uh, renovation needs under the transition to climate neutrality when you basically in the long run cannot use uh, fossil fuels with confidence that uh, we indeed need a uh, broad and deep renovation by 2050, so not uh, uh, shallow investments, but uh, 2050 uh, will need to be compliant with this no fossil fuel um, uh, market. Renovation scenarios uh, more specific uh, compared to previous strategies, which uh, we assessed several options, uh, rapid scale up of uh, deep renovation, 
uh, a lot of staged, uh, only staged approach and mixed. So here, this kind of mixed and staged approach is preferred with scaling up uh, deep renovation, but at the same time, uh, taking into account would be to balance with rapid anti-smoke action as Poland is suffering from high levels of air pollution and needs to replace a lot of uh, coal uh, boilers with the seeds to ramp up our capacities to actually deliver net zero compliant buildings uh, over mid and long term. Uh, we will provide uh, the current review of current policy and finance landscape. Uh, so uh, one overview of uh, what is happening. And uh, this is uh, at a glance, this is this preferred innovation scenario, which combines the stage approach, but quickly ramps up deep renovation, which may be more visible on this annual renovation rate. Uh, so coming back to, my, to the previous speaker, we need to, on one, uh, on one hand, to think big, to dream big, to scale up investments, but at the same time, there is some kind of starting point where uh, this is indeed a sleeping giant, which we need to uh, scale up and address uh, the current issues with anti-smoke uh, campaign. Uh, so uh, what we uh, propose is scaling up deep renovation uh, within the next few years to make it a market standard by the end of the decade, and at the same time supporting this boiler replacements and uh, road uh, uh, adjustment towards performing buildings just to uh, address energy poverty issues, address air pollution issues, but to uh, bring us on the road to this deep, fully deep renovation by 2050, uh, which results on, in some uh, uh, double uh, investments, but at the same time, uh, this, uh, this is necessary if we don't want to wait uh, for dozens of years uh, to innovate uh, the worst performing buildings and to address our uh, smoke pollution uh, problem. Uh, and moving on to our uh, recovery and science plan, just an overview. We also have followed this general structure uh, based uh, on the commission recommendations. So you can see that you have uh, green. Uh, green components, which is very important, but also digital one. Uh, and what is important, we are still uh, have not allocated loan part of the plan. And for renovation investments, the key aspects and the major uh, priority is investment in residential buildings. So this is both energy efficiency, but also replacement of uh, boilers. Uh, and here KPI is quite, quite significant. So it's uh, almost a million buildings. At the same time, we have uh, some uh, public sector buildings, school, libraries, culture centers. Uh, we've also some significant um, uh, budget allocated. And uh, this is accompanied by key reforms, which include support, uh, especially in the area of multi apartment buildings, uh, support programs, but also uh, some declarations about further improving queer air program, which is focused on single family buildings and uh, fired with smoke. And at the same time, uh, further fine tuning of Energy Efficiency Act, uh, unlocking uh, energy performance contract at ESCO operation opportunities and tracking uh, energy efficiency investment results. And here, uh, looking from the perspective of uh, independent think tank, some of our feedback uh, to uh, Polish RP is uh, it's great that we have as uh, renovation a strong uh, key investment priority and uh, very important uh, and much needed reforms for multi apartment buildings. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is no clear uh, indication what will be the final role of natural gas boilers, to what extent we will actually invest in more complex renovations to what extent we can be just replacement of boilers. Uh, this also applies to clean air program as such. So uh, how, uh, how it's going to be uh, tackling not only short-term smoke problem, but also longer-term renovation challenge. 
uh, and uh, there are broader issues with the plan as such. So uh, there are, for instance, no cross-cutting climate KPIs. So it's kind of somewhat difficult to measure its impact on green transition on aggregates. Uh, and uh, once again, the issue of gas and the issue of a strategic framework, which uh, relies on some of the outdated documents. Uh, so this is it from me. Thank you very much. Alexander, thank you very much. And obviously we can see that there's a joint approach from, uh, from most of the countries. I think I was very impressed by the fact that you've actually an analyzed some of the weaknesses of the Polish government plan. I think clear, clean air policy is important for us, for our future generations, for our children, it must be a priority. So thank you for bringing that different angle in. I would now like to welcome our final speaker from the public sector. Martina Zaiba, who is an advisor to the Minister, the Ministry of Regional Development in the Czech Republic. Martina, please, welcome. Uh, dear everybody, uh, we, uh, we prepared in the last two years a national investment plan and uh, the preparation of the plan identified a number of critical uh, bottlenecks and uh, complicated uh, and sometimes paralyzed the investment activity of public investors. Um, in general, uh, uh, the most important is uh, uh, low project readiness and particular low proportion of digital green uh, and smart projects in Czech Republic. Uh, the second low use of uh, private capital to finance public investment uh, any problem with uh, methodology. Uh, um, uh, we, um, uh, we prepared uh, one component to uh, national uh, uh, recovery plan uh, uh, because uh, the low project readiness uh, is key problem, especially in the COVID time when uh, we need to start the economy with fiscal investment support. Uh, the main target of uh, uh, the main target is change in the mindset of public investors that will mean green and digital transition. Uh, our component, uh, uh, with the name uh, Systematic uh, Support to Public Investors, has uh, three pillars. We want to, to start with uh, huge upskilling uh, uh, because uh, we think that uh, most important for us is uh, 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 change mind, especially uh, we uh, need uh, that our investor know what is green project, what is EU taxonomy, how uh, to prepare a project uh, in line with uh, green agreement for Europe, uh, for carbon free Europe. Uh, the, the second pillar of our component is uh, uh, support uh, for concrete uh, public project. Uh, we want to uh, prepare about 150 projects uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, the target of the project uh, is uh, smart, uh, green and uh, digital. And uh, we work with the budget about 100 uh, million uh, euro. Uh, it's a very short uh, 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 description of our activity in Czech Republic. But uh, I think it uh, most important is discussion about this topic. Martina, thank you very much for that. Uh, and smart, green and digital is definitely a takeaway we need because we know that can have significantly more impact by taking that approach. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the public sector uh, presenters and I would like them to obviously hopefully stay for the rest of the discussion when the private sector come back. I would be very grateful if you could share your presentations with Ferdi so he can circulate them after the event. And obviously getting views from Slovakia, from Poland, uh, Julian, excuse me, from I think uh, Brussels, Bulgaria and the UK from your part and Czech Republic is very, very useful for everybody who is here. 
And it's clear that there are some very common approaches, but obviously individual problems from all countries. But again, I do see that CEE does want to step up and make a difference on the green transition. So I'd now like to move to the private sector. And our first speaker is uh, Pavel Kubitschka, Director of Strategy and member of the board at Chez Esco. And I'm sure that he is going to be looking at uh, their market solutions, which, which can be offered because I've worked with Pavel before and he tends to focus on concretny. So over to you, Pavel. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me, uh, my three minutes of uh, fame. Uh, let me just uh, start with uh, uh, the, uh, some interesting numbers. The building sector emits 38% of all uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, when adding building construction, uh, which is 10% of that. Currently, most of the technology required to decarbonize the building sector is already available. But renovating the large portions of the building stocks, especially the old buildings, this is going to be a very massive undertaking. The residential buildings, they are about 70% of these emissions and 30% roughly comes from commercial buildings like shops, offices, schools, hotels, etc. In uh, both residential and commercial buildings, most energy is used for space and water heating roughly 70%, then the rest is then uh, consumed by various appliances, lighting, cooking, space cooling, and, and other. An efficient way to decrease the amount of green, uh, greenhouse gases emitted from buildings is to reduce the heat demand. This is uh, one single uh, most improving uh, measure. Um, and heat demand for poorly isolated houses can be reduced by up to 80%, depending on the building type, insulation measures, etc. So and to decarbonize the remaining energy use, uh, owners would need to switch to electricity, district heat, renewable fuel use for space heating, etc. Um, if you look overall, almost 75% of the buildings uh, is energy inefficient. In the EU, EU and in Slovakia and in the Czech Republic, it's uh, very, very similar. There is a clear path to net zero. It's to improve energy efficiency through insulation and switch to renewable technologies. At the same moment, there is lots of uncertainties. It's uh, price, policy development, human behavior. And key enablers also, as we discussed uh, last time on our previous meeting, are the government uh, in incentives and policies. And there need to be some policies to reinforce adaptation. Um, there needs to be financially attractive solutions uh, because the building owners would need to increase yearly investments by definitely more than 50% to roll out new installations and heating technologies and uh, uh, renewable uh, sources of energy. Um, what I would say from my experience is that energy performance contracting is a great tool, especially now in the post-COVID economy key and all the issues that uh, companies and building owners have with, uh, with money. The experience from Czech Republic is that over the last 25 years, we had more than 250 projects in total. Uh, they brought savings to the building's owners of around 150 million euros. The first uh, energy performance contracting project was in the Czech Republic already in the year 1994. So it's a, uh, it's a long time. And the EPET EPC projects are uh, quite good for both industry as well as for the uh, public sector. And in the Czech Republic, we had uh, uh, successfully applied the EPC project to both the, for example, National Theater and to Rudolfino, which is a great historical building for uh, classical music uh, concerts. So, um, epic. EPC project is a great tool, but we still would need significant public uh, investments. 
there would need to be very clear standards and incentives for uh, building owners. And we need also a greater public acceptance. Uh, again, experience from the Czech Republic is that more and more companies are building new buildings in the top standards. We have first buildings in the Czech Republic that received uh, Leeds Platinum um, and uh, other, some other are already in the pipeline. Um, there is talk about buildings uh, with zero operating emissions. It's not yet here, but uh, I hope uh, it will be here soon. And the energy efficient building, it will shed uh, benefits to all of us, to the inhabitants and to people uh, uh, living nearby. So that's my, um, my brief story, brief contribution. Thank you for listening. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, some key takeaways from there. Uh, 28% of all emissions coming from buildings, including their construction. Uh, looking at new buildings, the fact they can be actually zero emission. We need to challenge the buildings that are being built to make sure those standards are maintained or else we're just gonna continue making a problem for future generations. Yeah. And obviously the private sector have a key role in that. And obviously the fact that 75% of all buildings are not energy efficient, Yes, that is a factor, but we've got to make the situation better and look forward. So, Pavel, thank you very much for your contribution. So, I'm now going to move over to Jan Matti uh, from Signify. Signify is formerly Philips Lighting, and he's got a short presentation that he'd like to do. And he will focus on concrete energy efficiency solutions. And so, and he will, we will circulate his presentation afterwards. Jan, please, your five minutes. Uh, thank you, John. Good morning to everyone. Um, Signify is one of the first companies uh, which uh, succeeded to achieve carbon neutrality uh, before it was a major topic in, of discussion as it is today. So we became uh, carbon neutral in 2020, uh, in, uh, in last year. Um, and we are looking into energy efficiency and CO2 emissions, those two topics which are very much connected uh, between each other. Uh, as today uh, topic is energy efficiency of the buildings. We would like to make a little point on, um, on this topic. And as it has been already said, we know that uh, buildings are consuming uh, a big budget uh, in, uh, in energy bill. And we know that uh, lighting is accounting uh, a major portion, sometimes between 40 to 50% of a city energy bill is going to a lighting itself. And knowing that buildings are inefficient uh, and uh, maybe three quarters of them are energy inefficient, we see that uh, lighting can be a contribution to uh, improving this efficiency. The topic we are discussing today a lot. And uh, we as a leader in lighting, we would like to give you some more insights and uh, tips and hints about how uh, state and governments can uh, direct their activities and their decision into going more green, into reducing CO emissions, and how to save the energy bill. Uh, nothing just switching to LED lighting in a, in a building or in a street light can save 80% of, uh, uh, of energy consumption, which is uh, considerable. So next one, please. Um, talking about uh, European recovery plan, uh, we in Signify, we have offering in, uh, in our product portfolio, which is uh, addressing very well five flagship initiatives of European Commission, which is the renovation wave, uh, where we see we can contribute by LED uh, renovation, switching the conventional lighting. We have offering in clean energy, we have offerings in circular economy, in clean mobility and in some niche activities like biodiversity. Uh, some of them can be combined and uh, can be used as, a, as a, um, something you can do in a very short time in a, in a quite considerable result. So switching, it's easy as a switching a light bulb. So you can switch a lighting today 
and uh, you have a savings uh, from day one. You have uh, savings in energy, in, in, uh, in monetary. So going into more precise numbers, so uh, if we switch to the next slide, uh, we have made an assessment and we are looking now into public buildings. So we look into the schools, in education sector, in the healthcare, and road and street lighting. So this is everything which is fall in the envelope of responsibility of governments, municipalities, and regions. Uh, we summarize data in uh, uh, CEE in countries listed in the slide. So uh, we have participants today from Poland, from Czech, from, from Hungary, Slovakia. So it might be interesting for them. And only those three sectors together, uh, we calculate the energy saving is uh, uh, about 8,000 gigawatts coming from switching lighting only. And of course, it translates into monetary uh, uh, explanation, which is the saving governments can make uh, every year. So this is say, not a one-time saving, but it's uh, every year saving, which when, we, when it comes to discussion of uh, value for money, uh, we have a specific programs to offer to you. And if any of the, uh, of the participant is in, interested into any uh, specific country or region or date, we can break down the data into, uh, into small bits and pieces and provide you numbers which are interesting to you. So this is what we would like to say today, that uh, looking into renovation, uh, uh, switching to LED lighting is uh, something which can save uh, a lot of CO2 emissions, which can be translated into uh, grown trees, into uh, other benefits. And we have created a couple of pages uh, in uh, local languages. Today it's, this, uh, it's accessible in Polish, Romanian and Czech. So you can see and, uh, how we can contribute to greener Europe. Thank you. Jan, thank you very much for that clear presentation. And obviously we've even been doing discussions on green energy with even NATO, who are looking at aspects of lighting as ways of getting the quick wins. And, and what is great about when we bring different areas together as Globsec is we can see common themes, but also try and bring partners together to cooperate. So I'd now like to move to Ramon Zakira, Lead Associate Director, Energy Efficient and Climate Change at the uh, EBRD. And uh, Ramon, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I will. I have a very brief presentation uh, on on who we are, what we do, and what we think is our role in the renovation way. So, uh, well, who we are is we are a development bank established in 1991, and we are operating in 37 countries, and 11 of which are uh, in the CE region. Um, and we have a, a long track uh, history in green financing, which dates back in 1994. Uh, and to date, you know, we've, we've invested over 35 billion euros in 2000 green projects. And in buildings, uh, I would say uh, it, this amounts to around 500 million per year. And uh, we have it in our target for, for the next five years in our strategy. Uh, the building sector is one of the key uh, thematic areas uh, of the EBRD in the next five years. Uh, and currently, uh, as a bank, we are delivering around 40% of our business in green finance. So we, we have a lot of experience in, uh, in uh, supporting and delivering this finance. Now, specific to buildings, how we tackle the sector, I, I would say we have three main uh, routes. Uh, one is we finance directly the public sector, you know, municipal buildings, energy efficiency funds, utilities, uh, district heating companies, uh, private part, uh, public private partnerships for the construction of new buildings. We do work through private sector, which is the key focus of the EBRD. We work you know, with property funds uh, directly, commercial buildings, urban development, real estate developers, but also the whole value chain of the construction materials and technologies that uh, supports uh, the renovation. And then we work through banks. So we provide credit lines through local financial institution through a product that we call green economy financing facilities and through which we have delivered over 4.7 million billion uh, over the past uh, 10 years. Um, so 
these these are the kind of fruits that we we we, we have and and specifically uh, we 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 have this business model where we combine policy dialogue with technical assistance where needed concessional finance and our own financing and specifically we have been working um, with the Slovak government and the Bulgarian government uh, in in supporting the drafting of the long term renovation strategy uh, also together with BPIE, uh, who was a partner in that, uh, and, and also we've been working uh, with the Hungarian government uh, for a similar assignment, where which was a bit broader and included also um, deep dive into the financing instruments and policy reform that are required to accelerate the renovation pace. And, uh, and in terms of finance, uh, we have a number of uh, examples in CE. We have been uh, supporting the in Lithuania, the VIPA Energy Efficiency uh, Fund for multi-apartment building renovations, which have been quite successful to tackle this segment of the market, which is quite challenging, uh, as well as also in Romania, Slovakia, Poland, Bulgaria, with our credit lines or you know public sector. We had a project in Poland recently. So, anyways, I'm not going to drill down into our case studies now because we don't have time, but we have experience in the, in the market. Um, and maybe just a few of our lessons learned and, and, and the barriers. I'm not going to drill down into the barriers, but I would say a few words just uh, to sum it up. Um, we see you know, some common barriers which are applicable to all market segments. Uh, and, and many of them relate to the fact that if you need to undertake a comprehensive renovation or so-called deep renovation, the payback time often ranges between 10 to 20 years or even more in, uh, in some countries, especially if the building stock is, if out, is outdated and you require structural strengthening, right? So you, it's not only about energy efficiency, it becomes also a structural issues because of the, the quality of those these buildings that are, you know, uh, significantly outdated. This is, uh, you know, hindering the, the, the palatability, let's say, or the financial viability of these, of these, uh, of these investments. Um, and then you have, you know, some specific, uh, you know, barriers and drivers for each sector, you know, the residential sector, which is highly fragmented, you know, the public sector with its uh, challenges in terms of priority, prioritizing the funding and availability of finance, public finance. And obviously, the, on the commercial sector, the kind of split incentive between the owner of the building and the, and the occupier of the building, those that are actually running the building, right? Um, and we draw many lessons learned, but I wanted to draw just here four key ones for you. We, we believe that there are no, there is no silver bullet. You know, we have different instruments are required for different sectors and different markets. You, you don't have one fit for all instrument that would resolve the renovation issue. The second thing, lesson learned that we, 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 we draw is that we really are serious about accelerating the pace of renovation. We need some subsidies or incentives uh, to overcome some of these affordability issues and 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 uh, and challenges that i mentioned earlier on in terms of you know the payback and and really making uh, uh, the you know building owners decide sooner rather than later to undertake those investments also we believe that we have seen program failings in the, in the past where there was no provision for technical assistance especially in the residential sector where you know people may not have a good grasp over what energy efficiency means having some uh, uh, support or technical assistance provided by you know either government entities or other 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 forms is really key it's really crucial because otherwise it's very hard to you know make sure that these investments are aligned with the required space and then the fourth uh, and last is that while we see that ESCO can play a key role, as a, you know, colleagues in our panel were mentioning on the lighting, on the energy supply side of things, we don't see this as a model that works for comprehensive renovation, particularly if the buildings are old and require structural strengthening measures, because we have seen many cases where, you know, the ESCO was starting works and then we realized that, you know, if they were to insulate the roof, the roof may collapse, you know, and they would have to basically invest more. So to conclude, where do we see our role as, as EBRD in, the, in supporting uh, CE countries in the renovation wave? We, we see really four key roles for ourselves. 
the first is to draw on lessons learned across countries and best practices and partner with governments to you know, translate this into key enablers, triggers, you know, policy reforms, incentives, and the right, the right tools to basically trigger and enable the market. We also need to basically, we see ourselves as working with, uh, with uh, in the markets to devise aggregators that can, to which fin financing, uh, funding and uh, incentives could be provided. Because as I said, the market is highly fragmented and you need some key players that would have some responsibility over this renovation. And we have identified here five of them, but this is not again, a comprehensive list. We also see ourselves as working across the market as supporting the demand. So helping you know, the, the actual building owners, but also supporting the supply of technologies and materials because we work across the value chain. And again, we work directly with, uh, with you know, building owners and then directly like you know, owners of building portfolio, which may not be again, a big aggregator like, like those on the top, but that can still play a role in, in uh, promoting the renovation wave. That's all from my side. Thank you. Ramad, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, which clearly shows the EBRD's leadership role across the region. Uh, very useful to remember there are no silver bullets. We've got to have approaches uh, that cover all areas. I think it was very important, the comments that in areas we're going to have to subsidize. I mean, it's the future of the planet. We've got to get on with it. it but not everything will be just financially viable. We actually have to make a difference. And obviously there is a lot of value for everybody in your presentation, which I hope you'll be allow us to share later. So thank you very much for that. And to thank you for all the speakers. Now we're not bad for time. We've actually got 21 minutes for the discussion. And uh, I'm sure some of you will want to come in and we pose some questions before the event. And I'll just run through a few of them uh, and then we'll open up the discussion. Uh, the first one was under the immense time pressure, how would you evaluate the drafting and consultation process? What lessons can be taken into national MMF perceptions? Well, we've had quite a lot of comments on that already. How will this, this next question, how will the stimulus be packaged together with EU funds and commercial loans? What are the expectations for leveraging private investment? And we had some comments on that. Uh, what, needs to be done after final submission in preparation for the implementation phase. Well, maybe that's something we can touch on. How will the funding matrix be divided across the building segment categories, residential, public, and commercial? We had several presentations on that from uh, the various representatives of ministries. However, there's one here that's standing out for me. How is the national building database registry serving to standardize and enhance portfolio uh, management? I'm not sure we've had a comment on that. So I'll be looking for somebody to the floor to open up that. Maybe one of our representatives, maybe CBRE can have a chat at that one. How is the RRP for building renovation aligned with 2030 emission reduction targets and energy efficient targets? What benchmarks and milestones have been articulated? So I would like to open it up to the floor. Uh, if you wish to make a comment which contributes to, to the output or to a specific question, uh, raise your hand if I'm not seeing you, please, please wave or send a message and Ferdy will be monitoring too. So the one question that I felt that was not discussed was about the National Building Database. Does anybody wish to comment on that aspect? John, maybe if I may. Yes, this is Thomas Hegedus from CBRE. Thomas, welcome. Yeah. Hello. <clears throat> uh, thank you for organizing this very interesting discussion. Maybe uh, from our side, one point that uh, the governments in Slovakia and Czech Republic, uh, from the discussion, it seems to me that everybody is focusing only on the energy efficiency. And uh, uh, that, is, that is a really kind of a limited view on the problem because uh, you can have a very energy efficient uh, office building uh, that is very poorly utilized. And it's a bad office building. Yeah, you can have a very energy efficient school that doesn't have a doesn't have a sports yard. Yeah, so it's actually a very bad school for children if you don't have a uh, don't have a playground. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, therefore, uh, the database that you mentioned is absolutely a key. We have a database of all the buildings, but the database that is multidisciplinary. That means that if we talk about office building, we need to know how many people sit there, how many people per square meter, how many desks, uh, and things like this. So not only the energy efficiency, because uh, uh, this way we might reconstruct buildings that we will uh, that we will empty in few years because they are not fit for the purpose. So maybe that's a comment from my. So T Thomas, thank you for that. That's a, that's a really good point because at the beginning, one of the comments I made is we've got to spend the money wisely, and that means we have to make sure that the investment in these buildings makes them future proof for the future because otherwise we're just wasting money. So I think that's a very very good point. Uh, we are waiting for Norbert Kurilla to come back, who is uh, from the president's office in Slovakia, and he's a great innovator on green things. But I'd also like to take this opportunity. We have representatives from the German chamber, French chamber. We have our ambassador, uh, Slovak ambassador from Croatia here, um, Marino. And uh, there's a lot going on that we're doing on clean energy. So please, the floor is open. Who would like to make a point, ask a question? Yeah, Julian wants to uh, ask Julian. Attention. Yes, please, Julian. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, we, we didn't touch upon one area that I think is quite um, politically important and sensitive in Central and Eastern Europe. It's energy poverty. So uh, this is um, uh, quite uh, significant, and especially in some of the countries at a very high level. And it is exactly energy efficiency of buildings that can address this uh, problem probably in the best uh, possible way. Energy poverty is also a massive financial source because currently in all countries there are different instruments for supporting energy poverty, but these are mainly supporting um, uh, payment for uh, uh, energy bills. The transformation of uh, energy um, uh, payments for energy poor into uh, financial instruments that can improve the quality of building is also a massive instrument. So, and, and in that relation, I have also a, a, um, a question to Raymond and, and EBRD. Uh, you mentioned several areas where EBRD is involved and, and could be a driving force, and we know how what a good job it, it does. Um, you mentioned also that ESCO is, uh, uh, let's say, a luxurious kind of instrument. It doesn't work for old buildings, it doesn't work for poor buildings, and so on. But what about an ESCO component that could be integrated in other uh, approaches. You, you might have a poor building with people who are even in the energy poverty frame, but is it possible to devise a financial instrument that can get this small financial savings from the future from building renovation and somehow flip them back into a small contribution to the uh, initial um, renovation cost. Ramon, over to you. Thanks, uh, Union. Um, that's a very good question, and um, it's something we've been looking at for uh, for a while. And um, it, the, I think uh, certainly ESCOs can play a role, and uh, uh, especially, as I mentioned, in um, certain measures like uh, supply of heat like um, lighting uh, or integration of renewables in a building. You know, these are areas where we see that there is a strong business case. The question is, is you know, how do you make it, if you're talking about the ESCO as, let's say, a private company coming and investing into the, the project itself, right? And making, uh, repaying basically the investment from the savings. When you have, you know, uh, like in, in Hungary, we, our study was, was showing that, you know, due to the current energy tariffs, 
payback times are between 40 to 60 years. So very hard to do it for a comprehensive renovation. In, uh, in some other countries, um, we have seen various studies that are showing, you know, for comprehensive renovation, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. And this has only simple payback. So leave aside, you know, revenues that the ESCO or the private company needs to make on top of this or, uh, you know, interest rates or any other element that would come into play and that would only increase the, 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 the payback time. So for ESCO to work, either, either you then have to subsidize them, right? So you basically need to say, okay, we offer 50% of the CapEx and the other 50%, you basically private company come and do it, right? Uh, but it depends again from the state of the of the building itself, because uh, oftentimes, especially if you think about public sector buildings, even residential, we are often have they have often you know haven't been touched for 30, 40, 50 years. We are in a state which requires additional investments, and you can't just install an insulation on a building that has some structural issues. So, I think it's it's a bit challenging in the context of CE, depending of course on the market. And uh, you know, I, I, I never like to generalize because I think there are good cases where this has worked. But you know, uh, if we are talking about big numbers, I think it can deliver in certain market segments, maybe you know, the commercial sector, maybe some other sectors where, where you know, the building stock is not as, as bad. Ramon, thank you very much. Julian. Anything to come back on, Ramon, on, on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I just wonder that I mean, now we're pouring billions and billions and definitely not enough. My, uh, If I have to make a rough uh, comparison of, of what the task is and what the funding is, Bulgarian recovery plan um, uh, is planning something like a 1 billion uh, of, of euros for, for buildings. Renovation of buildings in Bulgaria is a task of 40 billion. So it, it's nowhere near that. So we have to, to, to mobilize funding. And exactly this type of instruments in which you can use ESCO components that can deliver part of it, 10%, 15%, 20% of the, of the overall funding, and then complement it with... Uh, transformation of energy poverty support, um, personal savings, and, and this is also a question that goes to the banks. Uh, can you think of something that uh, could mobilize the personal savings so that this personal savings deliver 2% interest rate rather than losing 2% every year. So, and what is the way not just aggregating projects, but aggregating financial sources so that you can create um, um, uh, a solid and long-term sustainable financial stream for, for innovation. The money is there. I mean, we see them. Tens and tens of billions of savings, of, of, uh, of support for energy poverty, of future savings. I mean, piles of, of money is there and we can't take them out to, to do the renovation. I mean, if I may is, answer to that, good. actually, because we have a good case and uh, you stimulated my, my let's say, answer. Uh, look, I, I agree with you. The, the issue, if, if you look at the, at the building sector, right, 80 to 90 percent is residential. Out of this 80 to 90 percent, depending on the country, you may have a bit more single family houses or multi apartment buildings. We had a good case where we exactly did what you mentioned, Julian, which is in Lithuania where there was this multi-apartment building renovation fund called VIPA. And this was basically channeling government loans, long-term loans, 20, it's, it's up to 15 years loans, basically, to uh, homeowners that wishes to renovate the whole building envelope. Because one of the issues in multi-apartment buildings, and I'm sure some of you are living in multi-apartment buildings, is how to get the, the buy-in, even if you have a nice ESCO company that is eager to do it, but how are you going to get the buy-in from the whole, you know, building and all the, the owners of building an apartment in a multi-apartment building, and how are you going to make sure that uh, the these liabilities, which goes beyond the lifetime, let's say, or maybe someone is selling his house or something like this, how are you going to deal with all of these technicalities? And 
and you know homeowners association cannot go to bank to to a bank to get long term finance they would give them two three years loan maximum so this uh, kind of uh, uh, energy efficiency funds where you know you channel long term finance that are backed by the state that are also backed by the asset which means if you sell your apartment then it goes on and where also you have a safety net for what you are also mentioning Julian about energy poverty you need to have something where you say okay you cannot afford to renovate you are uh, below the poverty line we cover or we help you uh, basically with the funding of uh, of the of the renovation cost right so you need to have a safety net and but you cannot have it equal for all because otherwise this 40 billion that you were mentioning an amount of money will not leverage much and uh, will will disappear because the, the the size of the of the challenge is in the order of trillions right that 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 we all know in the in the in the, in the eu market so i think you know if you have you know uh, um, some other type of aggregators where you can have definitely and build in and maybe bring in private sector for specific components as you mentioned which are easier to implement you know supplying heat uh, installing or uh, um, certain uh, uh, renewable energy technologies, this can certainly play a role, a role uh, in my view. But on its own, I think we, there, need, there need to be some somebody that takes the risk, that takes this burden and responsibility to basically drive this forward. Sorry for the long intervention. R Ramon, thank you very much for that. And I'm going to ask Ferdi to pay attention to energy poverty. Uh, we're going to be looking at that because we're also doing work with the digitalization of support payments for vulnerable people with another uh, line of uh, Globsec activities. Uh, two more questions, Alexandra. We've got that we're into the last six minutes. So if you can make it quick and then I'll go to Bogdan. OK, Alexandra, very quickly. So uh, basically looking at all the process which we are doing now with anti-smog and also planning for long term, and we see that it takes a lot of time. So we have, for instance, set up a database for buildings, but it takes time to collect data, to prepare it and so on. So uh, looking at uh, 2030 targets, uh, climate neutrality targets, uh, this is very close in terms of innovation phase. So the question is, to what extent in other countries uh, there is this kind of long-term visibility of upcoming changes that uh, we will perhaps have ETS in buildings for some other kinds of restrictions which reduce emissions? Is it present in other countries to mobilize this early investments or adjustments? Okay. Alexander, thank you for your question. What we're going to do is we're going to go and do some research on that and come back to you. Ferdi will have the task. Bogdan, your point, please. You, I'm going to have to give you one minute for this one. Okay. Um, uh, I believe that uh, all of what we said is very important, and especially as you said, uh, smart, green, and uh, digital. And we have to look uh, from the perspective of the priorities that, that we have. And uh, what we would like to, to, to underline that uh, once we look at the buildings, that uh, there are two uh, elements, there are heat and electricity in principle. Yeah? And these two energies are very important and setting the right priorities are important. And uh, uh, what, what, what we were making and we're trying to show you is the potential that, uh, that is within the area of the lighting that is substantial part of the energy saving uh, energy bill of for buildings yeah it's almost half of electricity uh, bill and uh, uh, we have also the uh, eco design roadmap that will ban completely the conventional lighting uh, that exists in most of uh, public buildings in uh, central eastern europe and uh, i believe that it is not uh, uh, it is overlooked by the government yeah, because that uh, deadline is uh, September 2023. Yeah, once you can't uh, simply service the conventional installation in buildings uh, in PA lighting, then uh, I believe that it will be in rush uh, to uh, fix it, and it will be never ever good. Uh, so um, I believe that it is still time really to plan in the Green Deal the. Uh, investments in the area of the public lighting, especially in buildings where this will be uh, necessary because of the legislation that was already approved. 
uh, and I see uh, the, the, some, I would say, discrepancies sometimes uh, from, uh, from looking from uh, outside of the box, uh, setting the priorities. Uh, and I believe that uh, once we look uh, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, long term uh, that, that we have, we have to look also on the uh, so-called, I would say, long-hanging fruits or the part of the infrastructure that will uh, determine also the, uh, I would say, well-being and, and health. We were talking about the, the I would say, the, uh, the uh, energy-saving buildings and w w the schools with very high, I would say, index, but no uh, uh, spot uh, hole, for example, yeah, or, or these kind of elements. So we need to uh, to, make, to, to rework this uh, uh, this exercise, also uh, setting the priorities on the way uh, to uh, to to uh, to first milestone that is 2030, reducing by 55% of emission. Yeah, that is uh, really uh, from now. Uh, and I don't see uh, out of the programs that uh, that was announced by various countries really that um, that we are on uh, uh, we are around the road. We are not at the right road. Uh, that's my uh, perception. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I now need to wrap up the session because we have one minute left and I know everybody has a busy schedule. I would like to thank all the speakers from the, the public and the private sector, and particularly the State Secretary for his keynote speech. On behalf of Vasil Hudak, the uh, Vice Chairman of Globsec, he sends his apologies. He had to go for a medical appointment, so you got me. I may not be the best, but I was certainly the cheapest as a replacement. And I would like to say that please, please follow up with us with questions, yeah? We will compile them. We're happy to take questions after this event if there's something to raise. There will be a policy outcome brief. We will be moving this forward. It is not just a session to have a discussion group, it's actually to have impact and change. And you'll soon be seeing an announcement of the, the Globsec CEE Clean Energy Initiative, which will be under the auspices of the President of Slovakia and the President of Croatia, which will drive forward to the desire for clean energy to take, to take a leading role in Central Eastern Europe and to change our lives and have a positive impact on the planet. So we're exactly at 11.30. I'd like to thank you for your time. Please stay in touch and please, your contributions do make a difference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John.